then and dreamy. Oh, hello there. Okay, this is uh, Alan English, and I'm sitting next to uh, Alfie Pritchard, and we're, uh, this is the uh, this is the third third your t- the <laughs> third pod- podcast we're doing on the subject of uh, creativity and madness from the Tea House Theatre in Vauxhall. So we're going to be uh, reading from a number of books and texts, and uh, you're just having a general all-round uh, discussion on uh, basically the theme of themes of manic depression and uh, also uh, eugenics in Nazi Germany. Alfie, sir, you want to kick us off? Yeah, um, we agreed last week that I would attempt to make some easily understood definition of bipolar as opposed to manic depression. Um, I prefer manic depression and I think, am I right, Alan, in saying that you're Similarly, yes, I am uh, similarly inclined myself yeah. because, uh, yeah. Now, we've got um, a Facebook page mm-hmm. which anybody can join, and uh, we'll give you the information after our discussion. And on that Facebook page is a quite a detailed um, look at why the bipolar be- became what it is. Um, so I'm going to do a very brief, if I can, introduction um, to bipolar and why we have to be very careful about using this expression in mental health and mental well-being. It, it, during the 1980s, the pharmaceutical industries in America um, became incredibly powerful and it was obvious that um, you know they were selling drugs basically to the general public for quite a lot of ailments and um, depression mental health was next on the list so basically the pharmaceutical industry began to invest heavily in mental well-being, mental health, and depression. They paid medical people fortunes, they paid colleges millions of pounds to help define what bipolar is. And what they came up with, um, the bipolar, is slightly different from depression because with bipolar, you can have bipolar 1, bipolar 2. And that gets rid of manic depression because if you've got bipolar 1, there's a special drug that you might be able to take. And there will be special sleeping tablets that you might be able to take. If bipolar 1 doesn't work, you can always try bipolar 2. Because that means, well, Basically, you're still suffering from depression, but that's because the drugs weren't working. So what we will do, we will supply you with a different type of medication or medications. So you might take um, an antidepressant for um, early morning depression, midday depression, nighttime depression, oh, nighttime depression, sleeping tablets. So, for a position of just taking one tablet, or maybe two tablets, you can now take three, four, or five tablets, all supplied by the pharmaceutical industry. If this doesn't work, there is always bipolar free, a totally different definition, absolutely different definition. That means that all the other drugs haven't worked, but don't worry, there's all these other drugs that you can try. Now I've been very cynical and very fast about this because it's a complex issue. Um, yeah, issue. It's a complex discussion about how the pharmaceutical industry is actually impacting upon mental health. The idea of a close analysis, the idea of actually listening to the the client and the client being us people who suffer from manic depression or depression, we don't actually have a say in this debate. It's 
professionals who are leading the debate, and those professionals are, guess what, paid a substantial amount of money from the pharmaceutical industries. Um, it's like in this country. We don't have a health system no more. We have one person who makes it up as he goes along. Try finding out what the relationship between drugs and mental health and mental well-being in this country, it's almost impossible to find out because we're selling ourselves to the pharmaceutical industry. So the idea of using bipolar as a substitute for the reality of depression, um, it, we need to possibly talk about this as an ongoing introduction. So people are taking it very, very seriously. Um, be careful of what drugs you're being given, basically, and make sure that your voice is being heard and being taken up because there are good people out there in the medical profession who know what they're talking about. But unfortunately, their voices are being swamped by money. So our depressions are now being dictated by an industry that is invisible. That is my quick introduction to, to bipolar. You know, Was I'm, it okay? It's <laughs> fine, you know, it sounds fine to me, mate. I mean, for me, I think uh, bipolar, an uh, very interesting kind of uh, words and the pictures that they create in people's minds. And for me, when it comes to defining this particular condition, you know, I think manic depression is so much better a term than bipolar. Because when I think of bipolar, I think of the word, I think of the colours blue and uh, white, and of like a pendulum swinging between blue and white, which is kind of a vague, abstract image, I suppose. But I also get kind of clinical connotations of something that is studied in laboratories and or in hospitals. Whereas with the term manic depression, I just I get a, a much clearer picture of kind of the the, uh, the raging aspect and the kind of the raging way, a possessive way that this condition takes a hold of someone and affects their behaviour. I get that impression so much better from the words manic depression than I do with the term bipolar. It's so uh, so much uh, it's so much more clearer. I mean, you're just it's uh, it kind of comes a lot. I mean, you've been talking. You mentioned briefly there about um, you know uh, psychopharmacology and also you know the uh, you know, can't look like you know, and, and the, the, the different polls they describe. But you know, for me, I find when it comes to you know describing mental illness, I've read uh, quite a few accounts about it now. I find you know, biographical accounts like the one I'm about to read from here much more penetrating than yeah. say, clinical yeah. analyses. Yeah, and and I know that so you know it. it so it's so a separate subject, but I think I get driven mad by reading all these academic texts when mm. I was at university. But no, here, I mean... Yeah, so shall we just sort of vaguely introduce what we will be touching on? And then okay, well, we're going to talk here, I mean, briefly, I'm, I'm going to read from a couple of sections from uh, An Unquiet Mind by K. Redfield Jamison. And this book is an autobiographical account by a clinician who deals with patients with manic depression, but who also has manic depression herself. And, uh, and she, the way she nails it, I mean, it's absolutely terrifically, brilliantly clear. And she, and she, she it's quite obvious, I mean, she, lo she loves poetry, she loves literature, and it kind of comes out in her language, and it's so, so beautifully written. And I, I just had to, you know, and the way it kind of captures, captures it all. But before Alan goes on, um, Jameson has been a bit of a foundation for our work as well yeah. because she wrote that wonderful introduction into creativity and depression. Um, touched by fire. Touched by fire. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a whole series of um, poems basically of people who suffered from manic depression um, and it is, it's absolutely beautiful and we still use it as a base because it is about language other people's language um, so I just wanted to bring that in so you know you 
if you get either one of the either that book or Touched by Fire, you'll see they are beautiful. Yeah, uh, Touched by Fire has got a good section on there. Uh, what is it, Lord Byron? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah it's, it's also funny as well. Although she's dealing with a horrendous. I identify with a lot there because I'm autistic, but uh, I kind of a lot of the qualities that she speaks about kind of identify with me on a personal level. And my, uh, you know, my uh, my uncle had uh, bipolar, so you know, she's still got it, he's still alive. So I could relate to this kind of mm. very, very deeply, and you know, and it's it's just I, I, don't, yeah. I don't even want to describe it anymore. I just want to really get into it. If you it. could, yeah. Okay, so here we go. This is uh, what, like, you know, more over and above, you know, any kind of physical effects. What you, what these sorts of conditions. I mean, all health conditions really affect is the way you relate to others. And you know, she she, she puts it here. She says, no amount of love can cure madness or unblacken one's dark moods. Love can help. It can make the pain more tolerable. But always, one is beholden to medication that may or may not always work and may or may not be bearable. Madness, on the other hand, most certainly can and often does kill love through its mistrustfulness, unrelenting pessimism, discontent, erratic behaviour, and especially through its savage moods. The sadder, sleepier, slower and less volatile depressions are more intuitively understood and more easily taken in stride. A quiet melancholy is neither threatening nor beyond ordinary comprehension. An angry, violent, vexatious despair is both. Experience and love have, over much time, taught both of us a great deal about dealing with manic depressive illness. I occasionally laugh and tell my partner that his imperturbability is worth 300 milligrams of lithium a day to me, and it is probably true. Sometimes, in the midst of one of my dreadful destructive upheavals of mood, I feel Richard's quietness nearby, and I'm reminded of Byron's wonderful description of the rainbow that sits like hope upon a deathbed, on the verge of a wild, rushing cataract, yet while all around is torn by the distracted waters, the rainbow stays serene, resembling, mid the torture of the scene, love watching madness with unalterable mien. But if love is not the cure, it certainly can act as a very strong medicine. As John Dawn has written, it is not so pure and abstract as one might once have thought and wished, but it does endure and it does grow. Yeah, that kind of gets you. A relationship is uh, relationships love for people with night depression and you know, create and you know, and kind of creative dispositions overall are possible, but they are very very hard and often don't work. But they are it is possible, as you can see here, for one to be you know successful. I so think. Also, what we need to look at, not today, but look at this notion of love within manic depression. Because it is a difficult one, isn't it? Sometimes I, f I feel, well, sometimes I have to ask myself, what the hell is love anyway? Is it just an expression? Is it a poetic um, invention? We think we know about love, but do we know about love? Whereas hate is more earthy because it's very destructive and people can understand that. But love is more demanding of an individual. It's more demanding of couples and it's very demanding yeah. of culture and very, very, very demanding of society. You made me think here, you know, of uh, if I can go in, a friend of mine, mm. you know, just shortly before we, we, we started this talk, I showed you a book I was yeah, on endometriosis. Yeah. And well, that's a physical condition, not, uh, not a mental condition. The effects on uh, relationships are just as destructive mm. 
you know, because you know, the friend, a friend of mine who's uh, a single mother, she has endometriosis, and she saw her condition all but destroy her relationship with the father of her son. Uh, and it's it's very very it's because you know. It, Lack, it's a kind of a lack of understanding and I think also it can alter people's, I think it can alter people's perception of how the relationships are or ought to be. You know, the partners of people with endometriosis, once the condition becomes apparent, might find their perceptions of the person they are in love with irrever irrevocably changed. And it might even kill, you know, it might even kill the relationship as my depression mm. does. So, and uh, I, I think we're, we're still at a relatively intolerant level. I mean, it was barely a century ago that we're, st we're still tossing people with these conditions, my depression and endometriosis into asylums. And of course, women got the worst mm. end of it, no question. Yeah, it's, 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 well, we've got it's, one book that we could probably look at next week. Right. And that was the book written by, um, what have I forgotten the name? You're thinking I know of her. Women of War. No, no, or, 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 I would like to bring that over. Okay, it's Barbara Taylor, the, Barbara uh, the Ty Last Asylum. Yeah, yeah The okay. Last Asylum, mm -hmm. um, which goes into the history of, of the asylum. It, again, it goes into the history of her breakdown and the history of being incarcerated in Freeham Barnet, as it was called then, Lunatic Asylum. That was quite recent. And, um, and the horror of that asylum. It did boast, and it did boast, the longest corridor in the whole of the world to treat lunatics. But I think if we can get around to, if not next week, some other time. Uh, yeah, okay, that is what, I mean, I, I remember walking down, I mean, if anyone's been to hospital, I remember going up to Forrester Hill Hospital in Aberdeen, I, I saw some pretty long blooming corridors there. The longest corridor in the world to treat lunatics. Oh, Christ! Mm. Very forbidding image that. Anyway, yes. Yeah, <laughs> just going back into this though. I mean, you know, with uh, you know, with you know, with loving, you know, with you know, an unquiet mind. I mean, she, can, she, she says this. We all build internal seawalls to keep at bay the sadnesses of life and the often overwhelming forces within our minds. People do build invisible barriers. She says. In whatever way we do this, through love, work, family, faith, friends, denial, alcohol, drugs or medication, we build these walls stone by stone over a lifetime. One of the most difficult problems is to construct these barriers of such a height and strength that one has a true harbour, a sanctuary away from crippling turmoil and pain but yet low enough and permeable enough to let in fresh seawater that will fend off the inevitable inclination toward brackishness. For someone with my cast of mind and mood, medication is an integral element of this wall. Without it, I would be constantly beholden to the crushing movements of a mental sea. I would unquestionably be dead or insane. But love is, to me, the ultimately more extraordinary part of the breakwater wall. It helps to shut out the terror and awfulness while at the same time allowing in life and beauty and vitality. When I first thought about writing this book, I conceived of it as a book about moods and an illness of moods in the context of an individual life. As I have written it, however, it has somehow turned out to be very much a book about love as well. Love as sustainer, as renewer and as protector. After each seeming death within my mind or heart, love has returned to recreate hope and to restore life. It has, at its best, made the inherent sadness of life bearable and its beauty manifest. It has inexplicably and savingly provided not only cloak but lantern for the darker seasons and grimmer weather. Yes, love. I think we can hit upon love later. No, Oops. I mean, you know, lo you know, it's, it's lo you know, love, love is, love is important. I, mean, yeah. I once wrote, a, I once wrote a, once wrote a poem. I, you know, it's what you know, poets might call a list poem mm. on uh, you know, uh, on love poetry and uh, on, on, okay, on what love, what love is. Right? 
Yeah, and I, I tried to I tried to refine what it was because you're right. It is it is kind of very very difficult. Yeah, I think it's very you know, it's very easy to fall in love, but it is an act of will to actually stay in love with someone, especially over a longer period of time, and, and it, it's an effort. It, you know, it needs work, and sometimes the person is worth that effort, and you know, sometimes it isn't. And I think women, because you know, I think they're more intuitive and emotional creatures than men. I think they recognise this reality mm. much more than men do. Not saying men are stupid or incapable. Well, I think it's a more distinctive <laughs> reaction on the part of women to recognise this reality of love, you know, than uh, you know, you know, than men. I think, I, think this is, I just think that's a reality. You can say what you like on it, listeners. By all means, feel free to talk about it. But one, one interesting aspect of um, the book here is that the ways are insistence on medication as a kind of a as kind of an assistance in managing her condition and i agree you know yourself you know that uh, med your know, medication you know your know, psychiatric medication you know it can it can often you know often as a help but thing is now i mean we've kind of created a society around it where uh, we're kind of you know where nearly everybody is being kind of prescribed medication mm. you know for kind of dealing with normal reactions to traumatic events and yeah you know, it's you know, there are some people and it kind of moves on to the next book we're going to be discussing here you know it, uh, it's kind of to some people it's gotten a little bit out of hand you know and you know, the uh, oh um yeah read that bit and I'm, I'm just after that i just want to give you a very brief case history so, you know, yeah. you know, at the point of this book, I mean, you know, we're, we're going to include this in the bibliography, but uh, James Davies in his book, Cracked, Why Psychiatry is Doing More Harm Than Good, I mean, he argues that uh, a lot of the, you know, the definitions of psychiatric illnesses or psychiatric disorders haven't been decided on the basis of science, but rather a committee of doctors who can't really agree amongst themselves the basis of this or the symptoms for a lot of these conditions and it's kind of decided by committee mm, yep really and that she, he, in, he sees that as a flaw because it shows decided by committee so there's no kind of scientific basis it goes back and to hence, bipolar it, it, it's all, yeah. and, and it's all kind of subjective you're, you're right it goes back to bipolar you know, the voice of the of the actual sufferer it <laughs> becomes bureaucratized it's got a, you know there's a kind of a, a point here that i want to go into and it's uh, yeah, kind of like the effect of over-medicating and uh, what that can really do to you. Okay, now, and often, you know, it's often kind of that people self-medicate all the time. You don't need to be prescri necessarily use prescription medication, you know, in order to kind of medicate your, your, your any psychiatric issues or any kind of emotional problems that you might be having. I mean, people self-medicate all the time when they use alcohol or you know, or kind of like you know, illegal drugs or your you know, or recreational drugs as you might call them you know and uh, i think you know, the, the thing with uh, this uh, you know, with these things are is that they don't kind of you know cure your uh, your problems or whatever's causing your emotional problems is that they numb you to them and uh, davies makes the case here that uh, okay i'm reading out now that's numbing things isn't curing thing curing things or even in the long run helping things it's just providing a temporary and superficial distraction and one that may store up problems later along the line. For example, let's say you're really nervous about a party you've been invited to on Saturday night. And perhaps you're nervous because you think everyone there will be smarter than you, more attractive or more interesting. Anyway, you get there and no one is talking to you, so you grab a drink and gulp it down. After a few minutes, you relax a little and start up a conversation. And because you're feeling a little better, a little more confident, you have another drink, and then another, and another. Soon you're swaying all over the place, bumping into things, hiccuping, and chatting to everyone. So now you are no longer nervous, but you are not your usual self either. In other words, although the alcohol has had an effect, it hasn't uprooted the reason you felt insecure in the first place. It's merely altered your state of mind so that you no longer experience your insecurity. It has replaced your feeling of inadequacy with a feeling of what the heck. A feeling that's neither a natural nor permanent product of your personality, but rather a manufactured outcome of the alcohol you've been drinking. 
The alcohol has no more cured you of your insecurity than caffeine cures you of your tiredness. It has just changed your state of mind while you're under its influence. And that's precisely how antidepressants work for some people. Not curing us, but changing us. Yeah, the yep. Whole, the whole, uh, yeah, yeah. Welcome to the world of bipolar. Uh, psychopharmacology. Yes, that that sums up. Yeah, I once saw dangerously an, yeah, yeah. basically. I once saw an advert. Uh, you know, I can't remember where it was. It might have been on the tube or on the bus stop or whatever, where it says, uh, "Pharmaceutical companies don't create cures; they create customers." Mm. I was kind of like an image of this human being made up entirely of pills whilst taking a pill at the same time. It's quite a disturbing image. You know, these companies don't create cures, they create customers. Mm -hmm. And I you know, always say this, I mean, you know, we can be upfront about it. So you and I have both kind of experienced emotional problems and we have to an extent take, uh, you know, you know, uh, you know, medication to kind of help manage on them. But, you know, it's especially when they become over the top, but it kind of, it, it does get a hand. And some of the medicines they, these guys, they, these people do prescribe, I mean, I'll, I'll say last time, I've, I've taken a, a few of them for my emotional difficulties, you know, my anxiety, my anger, and also my, and my depression, but also my autistic meltdowns, my tendency to just kind of explode at random in the middle of the street. And I have taken kind of uh, your uh, pills for that, you know, to kind of stop myself doing that and self-harming. And, and I have to say that some of the pills that they prescribe you are very, very strong and very strong sedative effects. I mean, your likes of, uh, you know, uh, Risperidone or certainly, oh my God, I don't know how anyone else feels about this medication, but in my experience, that stuff is strong. Mm. You know, it's got enough, you know, it's strong enough to knock out a blooming elephant in the right learning dose. And it really is, it really is, you know, it really is tough stuff. But, you know, first time I think I took some, you know, you know, you know, kind of anti-psychiatric medication, I think I slipped in for the very first time. And, you know, I had an appointment with somebody, and she said, Blimey, hell, you're late, aren't you? I've, you are never late. What's going on? I had to explain, look, I've been taking this anti-psychiatric, you know, antidepressant stuff, and it's just totally bored me out. It just totally made me knackered. You know, so, you know, it really, you know, it's touch and go, touch and go. I think medicine is really, when dealing with these things, are kind of a last resort, but obviously for some people, with uh, some conditions, they're you know, like my depression, like Kay Redfield Jameson's been discussing, they are essential because you, you, you need some help to stay on mm. top of these things. There's a bit at the back of that book, mm -hmm. no, on the cover, I think it's there, mm -hmm. where he describes at one time there was about, what, 150, 105? Okay. Yep, okay. So yeah, you got is, it. Here it is, okay. Why, without solid scientific justification, has the number of mental disorders ridden from 106 in 1952 to 370 today? And that's more than double mm. in you know, less than what 60 in less than 60 years. You know, now you less. could argue that that's because of the pressure of yeah. the society that we built up for ourselves, the consumerism, the if, if you turn on the television, it's all about the body beautiful. It's all about going on onto yeah. a particular type of holiday. It's uh, about going away somewhere. It's about you, 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 you. It's a very narcissistic culture. Yeah. So that could come into it. But it gets back to the pharmaceutical industry with yeah. bipolar saying, you've got this. Okay, you take that drug. Maybe you haven't got that. You try drug two or drug five. It goes on and on and on. Yep. The individual is rarely taken seriously. It's the capital. Is, yeah, capital is the driving force at the moment. We become narcissistic, inward looking, um, yet we believe that we're outward looking. Our whole society is geared towards me, 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 me. Yeah, and always yeah, that's, that's the, me. Uh, the, yeah, that's me, me, me uh, being okay, totally pessimistic. Yeah, okay. Later on in the book, I want to throw the, uh, the 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 you know the medical world has kind of been party to this because he describes you know uh, psychiatrists or uh, you know or, and, and doctors who are you know paid medical uh, consultants for some of these companies yeah. and to, to help them push their products. And the argument there is to what extent has your integrity as a doctor and as a scientist been compromised 
you know, by your willingness to help push the, you know, to help push these products. I mean, you know, your independence of thought. I mean, so your, your, and your kind of objectivity, your scientific objectivity. How has this been compromised, you know, by you know, by what you're doing here, by being paid to push these products? I think it's why a lot of people kind of, uh, you know, you know, distrust the kind of the, the medical establishment. You know, right now, and this kind of, the, and the whole notion of big pharma, mm. that in these kind of uh, pharmaceutical companies that are now not to cure you, but solely to make money. You know, which kind of feeds back into the whole uh, autism, you know, mm. you know, autism causes vaccines thing, which is really kind of another, another side to this thing, right? It's basically what you might call the vaccine wars. But the people pushing the kind of the vaccines cause autism's story. You know, they're no blooming saints either. In fact, you know, what they're, they're doing as much damage, you know, in my opinion, you know, to you know, autistic people and, and you know, spread as much information, misinformation or compromised information as the very people they're criticizing. You know, it's really, mm. it's, it, is, it is destructive and I think it's, you know, uh, it, you're right, it is, it, it is a product of our kind of capitalist consumer society. You know, it's basically one group of people telling the general public, don't buy their products, buy ours instead or by our message uh, by our message by our message you know the media is the message and vice versa you've only got to look at what's going on in this country with our so-called health system which doesn't exist no more because it's led by one man and with no experience in medicine whatsoever but that's a different, you know, that's getting on to different areas of um, what's going wrong. Well, okay, I mean, you, I mean, you can ask, I mean, I had a, a kind of a similar argument, I mean, uh, we've got to around, uh, you know, a kind of reason why this, you've got uh, like a numerous amount um, of, uh, you, know, you know, psychological disorders and, and kind of why our, you know, our health system, as you say, doesn't really work anymore. It's because you know a lot of the people who are kind of employed as middle managers have no idea about the industries in which they work. Yeah. I mean, they are skilled as managers, you know, but they but they don't know anything about you know the particular industries. I mean, James Kilman, you know the uh, you know the, the novelist. I mean, he made a similar criticism about art that the people are kind of in, who administrate art don't know anything about art. They know how to sack a hundred thousand people, but they don't know anything about art. You know, and the people you know, who run these doctors, I mean, they know how the people who can run the can the medical companies or the hospitals. They know how to make you know people redundant, but they don't know anything about bloody medicine. Mm. You know what I mean? Can that I, compromises yeah. kind of the treatment and the you know that. Can I just receive. do a very tiny um, oh, case study of go. somebody I know who um, is psychotic? Right. who's been hospitalised quite a few times and has been given so many different diagnoses of, about what triggers that person's psychosis and ever knows how many different drugs that person has been told she has to take and the danger is, for me, the people who are doing that are very kind, caring people. But not, they're not trained at all in what you could say the basics of psychotherapy, the listening cure. And this is where this comes into. The patient isn't listened to. What they do, what not the patient, what the professionals do, as I say, they're kind and caring people. They go to a book, they look in that book, this is your clinical diagnosis and this is the drug you're going to take. No, says the client, the patient, no, I know what's wrong with me. I know what triggers. No, you don't because you're ill, because it's in the book. So you, 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 we will give you this drug and we will give you that drug. But I know what's wrong with me. No, you don't, because you've got psychosis. What chance have we got with that type of mentality if you do not listen to the person? Now, I know that 
psychotherapy scares a lot of people and I, I, I know it comes in for a lot of um, flack and I give a hell of a lot of flack. I, I was training to be a psychotherapist but the thing is it does listen to people and we've got to start listening to people even if our own opinions are under attack because our opinions are only opinions they're not based in reality they're usually based upon our own sense of fear and this is why I get angry if we can't change our opinions then we end up where I think we will be going soon when we discuss euthanasia yes it's a heavy subject I know but we have to listen we can't keep hold of our old opinions our, our opinions are just that it's hot air we we have to change as individuals oh well, okay it's just a kind of society in general you know we've got, we must evolve or perish you know, as a, as a, mm. you know as a society evolve or perish grow up or die you know it's, it's, it's just this you know, I, I, I say that you know because I can't live in my own way and mm. my own kind of patterns which might not be to everyone's taste I like and, but you know that's you know, it's too well we've got to change we've got to learn to listen to each other you know I just can't. What well, I've kind of pulled back into the, you know, the the kind of the, the topic here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that there's got to come a point where you know where the kind of people have to cast kind of, you know on either side of the kind of different divides here. You know, or when it comes to kind of autism versus vaccines, when it comes to medicine, have to learn to listen to each other. I mean, you've kind of got to strike a balance. And you know, I think I don't think you can kind of uh, over medicalize suffering. Mm. You know, you can't, you can't wipe out completely because it kind of goes here, I mean, you know, the, uh, the I'm kind of, you know, to, just a, my last quote here from James Davies, correct? Okay. Suffering has a redemptive role to play in human life. As if from affliction there can be derived some unexpected gain, new perspective or beneficial alteration. If this vision could have a motto, then Thomas Hardy captured it well. If a way to the better there be, it first of ex exacts a full look at the worst. The positive vision of suffering, thus considered, sees pain as a kind of liminal region through which we can pass from a worse to a better place. A region from which can thus be derived something of lasting value for individual life. But the negative vision of suffering, on the other hand, asserts quite the opposite view. Namely, that little of value can come of suffering at all. It says that there is no new vista or perspective to be gleaned at its end, nor any immured insights to be unlocked from its depths. It is thus something to be either swiftly anesthetized or wholly eliminated. For what good is an experience whose most obvious features are pain and inconvenience? See, kind of the clash there. Mm. Two perspectives on suffering. Yeah. It's absolutely it's crazy. You know, but you know, it's in, and this is kind of what we're kind, kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of up there. It's captured in the nuts sense, the kind of the collision between positive and negative attitudes towards suffering, to, towards, you know, between uh, over medical, you know, over medicating, you know, suffering to not medicating it at all. Mm. You know, in other words, man up, get on with it. You know, it's like, no, no, you've got to take, you do have mm. to take this seriously. You have to deal with it because it's holding people back. Yeah. When you know, when you kind of reach a, a kind of a, a, de, a de, when you can reach a depressed state, I mean, it's. I, I, I think it's possible to kind of gain more insight, to, to gain more insight to life than if you're thinking more positively. I find that some, I, you know, I'm a bit wary myself of you know, of overly confident or overly positive people, hmm. because you know, <laughs> I don't trust them at all. <laughs> Because I'm always inclined to think, you know, wait a minute, yeah, so what's the catch? Yeah. You know, what, you know, what, you know, what what's are the you catch or what's the trap? What's the catch? What's the trap? I mean, you know, you know, that's just me, I think, you know. Just, no, I think, um, you, know, uh, you know, but yeah, it's just, I think, you know, these people are being, you know, these, these people, anyone who's wholly positive in life is trying to sell you something, mm. you know, mm. and you, you, I think you've always, you've, can I go it's called the happy pill without the happy, you know, without, uh, the, without, pill. without yeah. the pill. If it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Mm. You know, that kind of needs to be kind of balanced out with an awareness and indeed experience of the, the kind of the negative aspects of life. 
you know, because you, you, you need, you, you, kind of, you kind of need that in order to, you know, to persevere, to, you know, continue. Well, I think persevere, you're, you're, mm. But you, you can, on the other hand, get too caught up in it to the point where you can't, you know, engage with society mm. at all if you're too caught up with your, you inside your own negativity. Mm. And it's a thing that fills a lot of people, and particularly a lot of artists, who take to self-medicating as a result. Because they're too caught up in their own Tell negativity, me about it, yeah. which sadly, which mm. you know, is a, mm. a source for much of their art. You know, this, you know, the very muse can be you know, kind of like the cancer in a way, because it can slowly mm. kill them as well as inspire them. You know what I mean? Mm. <sighs> right. Yeah, you know, but you know, mo moving kind of away from this to from uh, you know the, the whole bipolar thing. I mean. My condition that I was diagnosed with was uh, Asperger's syndrome. In uh, you know, I think it was uh, this was when I was 16. It was after I'd given the psychologist I was seeing at the time. I'd seen quite a, quite a few psychologists by that point. You know, my life story up until that point, and a list of patterns I'd noticed in my own behaviour. And uh, my mother eventually revealed to me, you know, the condition that I, uh, I had was you know, Asperger's syndrome. And uh, for a long time, you know, Hans Asperger, he was a doctor who kind of who wrote about the condition that later came to bear his name in Austria during the Second World War. And it was widely perceived that up until at least a few years ago that it was his, you know, uh, studies of autistic children from whence came, you know, the, you know, the descriptions of his uh, condition that uh, the studies of his children helped save lives, helped save children from uh, the gas chambers. But, uh, you know, it, you know from the, and helped save them from the Nazis. However, recent uh, research, and encapsulated in a book by Edith Schiffer called uh, Asperger's Children, shows that, rather disturbingly, that Hans Asperger, even though he was not himself a member of the Nazi party, he was caught up in uh, Nazi activities and he was, through his work, culpable for the deaths of several children, and it was through his, uh, it was through, you know, it was through his work. He was uh, it, Nazi. He was working in uh, Nazi child psychiatry, Hans Asperger, and he, uh, you know, in the in his, uh, I think in his clinic, I think in, the, in his clinic in uh, Vienna, and. This way, it was through working here he discovered Asperger's syndrome, and what he was looking for in children was a feeling of gimmut, which is German meaning uh, social feeling. Mm. You know, can these children be a part of the vote, part of the social community? And some of the children he was studying, who displayed symptoms of what he called autistic psychopathy, they could, in his estimation, you know be useful to the VOC. They had a certain level of social feeling. However, there were other children who had autistic psychopathy whom he thought did not have game art and who could not be adapted to the VOC. And it was these children whom he dismissed and whom he sent from his clinic to a place called Spiegel, Spiegelgrund. And that was a... And it was from there. That was the last stop before you, you went to the gas chambers. Mm. Basically, and what it's uh, what a lot of people have described as the kind of the second Holocaust, you know, in during World War Two. Everyone knows rightly about the uh, the first Holo about the the, Holo the the Holocaust, where the you know six million Jews were annihilated, you know, and whilst you know, I you know, I certainly agree, you know, that you know, this certainly you know takes place. There was another Holocaust that is less discussed but was happening at the same time. Mm. And that was the elimination of other sorts of people whom Nazi society deemed undesirable and couldn't fit in with Hitler's ideals of an Aryan perfect master race. And we're talking about, uh, you know, you know Romani people, we're talking about gypsies, but we're also talking about uh, the physically disabled and, you know, you know the, the mentally ill here. And we're talking about... Autistic and, and autistic. Social out outcast under yeah. the Nazi doctrine of purity and that comes into the ambiguity of sexuality um, homosexuals got swept up lesbians got swept up trans got swept up it was an endless um, murder machine and 
the starting point with the Nazis and it's very worrying that some of these ideas are creeping back in to our political discourse is perfection. Something about being special from other people leads to Auschwitz. Or even worse, Auschwitz was the final destination. The worst happened before Auschwitz and that was the death camps. On the train, straight in, no way out, you're dead. Happened to the Jews first in the most disgusting of situations, but we'll come back to that in a moment with, with the Vanti. We'll, we'll we'll come back to that in a moment. Right, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, you know, it was certain. I mean, you know, Jewish people, you know, were, you were the targets of his eye. But you know, it was kind of like a whole swath. I mean, Hitler's ideals, you know, of uh, humanity were restricted to a very, very, very narrow range of people. You know, you know, if he kind of tried, wanted to narrow it down, I mean, he took what you might call Darwinism to its furthest extreme. And, you know, mm. and, and this social is, Darwinism. Social Darwinism, mm. and this is where this is where that I, where you know, da, I, this is where it's Darwinism taken to its you know, Darwinism mm. taken to its kind of like furthest step possible. You know, the survival of the fittest and whittling and whittling them down, birth control, mm. eugenics. Well, and so with forth. the, I mean, it, it 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 was a racial, purely racial doctrine yeah. at the start. Absolutely. And you've only got to look at the language that's in Mein Kampf. Absolutely. Where the Jew, the Jew, is a rat, subhuman species. The Jew should live in the gutter. The Jew is not human at all. It's there for everybody with... Wipe away your own opinions, it's there. This was a purely, uniquely racial doctrine. Nothing else and nothing less. And okay, at the start, it wasn't planned to murder. But they certainly, the language led only one way to the gas chamber. Gas chambers weren't invented. The killing fields on the Eastern Front are never taken into account. The German troops who were leading the death squads are never taken into account. Most of them were never ever tried. Most of them would write on to their families about what was going on. A lot of them took their families on picnics where they could sit down and watch Jews being shoved into pits and massacred. It's, a, it's the most horrendous history. And okay, the Germans look good in their black uniforms, in their grey uniforms. They look fashionable. They look slightly decadent. But just remember, under that image is hell. And it's beginning to raise its head in the demonization of other people today. Not, you know, it's there. Well, As, it's, it's, you know, uh, I mean, it's... Who was it? It was Bertolt Brecht said, I forget how it goes now. The beast is back on heat. And it is. I, I think it is, basically. But we'll mention that in a moment on this, this other book. Now, well, I'm just looking at this, I mean, I mean, Asperger's Children, I mean, it's a, it's a very short book. Mm. I mean, it's only, what, two, I mean, I've got it here in hardback form. It's 200 pages long, but... My God, it is not an, it's not an easy read. I mean, the things he is describing, the things the author is describing, yeah. so Edith Schiffer, she's the, the things she's describing, you know, are absolutely are horrifying. Well, this you know, is and, a, you know, yeah. what is, what's, you know, what's kind of, uh, you know, kind of more so horrifying is like Asperger's role within it. Okay, he's not a leader as, as such, and he's certainly not a, you know, a particularly strong advocate for Nazi views, but he is nonetheless a part of that machine. Yeah. As so many others were at different levels in that system that led to kind of the marginalization of destruction and destruction of Jews and you know various and numerous other different people who did not fit into this ideal. You know, during World War II, and I, I want to get into this because, you know, having a look at this, I mean, the eugenics and uh, sterilization in this book here. You know, so let, let's let's you know let's have a look. 
here, what the, what's been talking about. Now, now actually, you know, you know, Johannes Asperger, I think he, 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 he uh, wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't, you know, I think very harsh to begin with on, uh, you know, on people, but I think subconsciously, over time, you know, I think the the, uh, the the policies and the atmosphere he was working inside affected him. Mm. You see what's kind of unique about this? I mean, working inside a system that you might not you know, fully approve of, but which nonetheless unconsciously affects your views and your activities. It slowly draws yeah. you in. Yes. It's like... Okay, it, now, let, now check this out here. Okay. Okay, over time, Asperger became somewhat harsher in his eugenicist rhetoric. In an interview with the Small People's Journal on September 11th, 1940, Asperger likened children he considered to be disabled children to waste. Boasting there you go, language. Yeah, okay, exactly. Boasting that he could remediate youth's beliefs to be redeemable, irremediable, Asperger explained, with a coarse sieve, many useful things fall in the muck bucket. Take a fine sieve and economize. With human souls, too. Then slowly... Slowly, he said, some will become useful people. In 1941 and 1942, Asperger agreed with the premise that some people were a burden on the community, and that the proliferation of many of these people is undesirable for the Volk, i.e. the task is to exclude certain people from reproduction. Mm. Asperger did state that some individuals who might be remediated could find their place in the greater organism of the Volk, and that, for them, sterilisation would not come into question. Yet, while Asperger cautioned against the overuse of sterilisation, he affirmed it in principle. Now, I want to go in here fully, you know, to how, you know, this was his full kind of culpability in, the, in, in, this, in this horrible system. And, uh, now... Okay, now, Asperger's ward sent children directly to Spiegelgrund. This mm. was a kind of like a child killing centre. Staff recommended at least seven children to Spiegelgrund who did not perish and at least two who did. Now, of the children Asperger recommended for Spiegelgrund, available evidence suggests that at least two died. Both of the girls were severely disabled. Now, in all, Asperger appears to have been involved and the transfer of at least 44 children to Spiegel Rand. At least nine youths from his clinic, two of whom died in 35 youths that his city commission marked for Jaquilius action and died. Given that he served as a consultant to numerous city offices and that the records are incomplete, the total number of children Asperger recommended for Spiegel Rand is likely higher. These youths were not simply statistics. However, not an abstract set of symptoms. Asperger personally examined many of them, touching their bodies and talking to them face to face. How he and his staff judged the children and decided their fates was a formidable and perilous process. Something else I want, something else I want to look at you know, here, because when they were sent to Spiegel Run, I mean, the, the atmosphere in that place was horrible. They received no supervision, mm. and again, you know, they were frequently left to their own devices and it became kind of like the Lord of the Flies. Oh yes, yeah, when that's good with no yeah. real adult authority to supervise mm. and manage them, they kind of fended for themselves in the most horrible, blimmin', disgusting kind of a way. This is what a survivor says about the whole process here. Yeah. Yeah. Survivor Leopoldine Meyer, contemplating her experience at Spiegelgrund, Spiegelgrund suggested that complicity in the cruelty and in the Nazi system as a whole was pervasive and inescapable. She said people's potential for depravity would torment her throughout her life. She says, each person raises the question in me, are you for me or against me? It was always a question of survival and that question still lingers with me somehow when I meet somebody. With whom is he siding now and with whom was he siding then? And would he have helped you had he known, or would he not have helped you at all? I am not angry for anybody, for how can you be mad with somebody when the evil has no name, when the evil is just a part of life, like it was the case there? But the evil belonged there. It was everyday life, and can nobody I just questioned. Can say something? Sure. Very important there. 
are you for me or against me? That is, by its very statement, is the language of gangsterism, which the Nazis were. It's the language of hate. There is no sense of love or compassion. Once you go down that path, you're either for me or against me. You're almost to the edge of denying the existence of other people. And as you can see, I'm going to get onto this in a moment. But it's the language that is all important, and it was the language that was all important in Nazi Germany. Very important. Um, everything. Hitler never signed anything. He made speeches. He had visions, like a lot of politicians today. They don't have. They just have visions, and they're bolsterous and they're loud and they're populist. Hitler started out as a populist along with other extreme right-wing groupings. He took it one stage further. He brought in eugenetics. And it was the vermin of the Jewish people that he could bring in that disgusting ideology of eugenetics. Because that's what it is. It ends up on a train going across Europe in a carriage, covered in shit, no food, covered in piss, covered in lice, kicked off the train into a death camp. That is where eugenetics leads. That is the history of eugenetics. Now, I, I want to just say something that Alan touched upon. This is a very heavy subject this week. Um, and my moods have been up and down all week around this subject because it is totally depressing it shows up humanity for what it can become quite easy and i do say quite easy it can be and the more you read into it now i, I when i was doing my ma I, I was reading around nazism and i took i attempted to read mein Kampf, and um it was, it was just awful but I think this week for me has been um, not just not an eye opener, but a refresher of what I forgot. And there's a little book that have we got time that I'd just like to bring in. Um, and I'm sorry about this week being very depressing, but uh, we need, we need, we need, we need to understand the danger of what eugenetics leads to. It doesn't have any history except death. Right, sorry, and then we'll... No, I mean, uh, just as a kind of close off on this, I mean, you know, this, the kind of subject of uh, Hans Asperger, I mean, he did continue to work uh, after the war. Yeah. Hans, Hans Asperger, and, and I think it's, in my view, from my reading of this, I think his views changed again. As, when he was no longer a part of the Nazi machine, I think his views evolved to a point where I think it's kind of implied here that he started to, uh, I think he began to feel maybe guilt or maybe shame for this, mm. what his actions being a part of the system that he was a, you know, a part of. I think a lot of people in the who, have it, I get, I, who are a part of the Nazi regime kind of came to think that for themselves and about what they did you know, after the, you know, World War II was over. But looking into it here, okay. Asperger's actions were perhaps less straightforward than any label suggests. He navigated decisions in a proactive, individual way, making conscious choices to resist some aspects of the regime and conscious choices to participate in others. His decisions not to join the Nazi party and to remain a dedicated Catholic were difficult and unusual for someone in Asperger's position, yet he opted to participate in myriad organisations and institutions that promoted the political tenets, racial hygiene policies and systematic killings of the Third Reich. High-ranking Nazi party officials and colleagues deemed Asperger reliable and trusted him with sensitive information. 
top euthanasia figures in Vienna included Asperger in their inner circle as well as in the leadership of their field. What emerges is not a type of person but an individual who must be judged and his accumulations of decisions evolving and fluctuating over time. When it came to the child euthanasia programme, Asperger does not appear as a submissive figure working within a system beyond his influence, nor does he appear to have been coerced since many of his choices were elective. While knowing of the euthanasia programme, Asperger publicly urged his colleagues to send children to Spiegelgrund. He participated in numerous Reich offices that sent children to Spiegelgrund. He sent children to Spiegelgrund directly from his clinic. None of these were simple or ordinary actions. They required initiative, determination and improvisation. Asperger's actions are more reflective of the nature of perpetration in the Third Reich than those of more prominent figures. Individuals such as Asperger were neither committed killers nor even directly involved in the moment of death. Yet in the absence of murderous convictions, they made the Reich's killing systems possible. I just I want, want to go. Uh, yeah, one moment to back that up. And um, she wrote a book, uh, My Days in Berlin. It's just come to me. English woman, um, married to. Um, and, yeah, they, they stayed throughout the war in Berlin. And she said, The thing about Nazism, and Hitler in particular, because let's not forget that everything stemmed from Hitler. Hitler turned me into a murderer. By that, she said that she knew, or she was aware, of people disappearing and remained silent. So there was a lot of, you know, in, in essence, in Nazi Germany, turned you into a killer. I just wonder, though. I mean, I'm just this is the last thing I'm going to read yeah. on this book, Alfie. But uh, no, no, go for it. Yeah. No, but I just oh. wonder. I mean, uh, to how much kind of recognise enough for these people when you kind of come out of this re regime and realise what you were a part of? To what extent can you atone, or to what extent can you ask for forgiveness? Ah. And would it make a would it make a difference? And you. you Asperger had his own uh, kind of interpretation on this. Okay, and you know, Asperger wrote in 1948 that individuals had limited freedom of action and thus limited free will. Yet, since the individual had full freedom of thought, thoughts were the true measure of the person. Recanting an immoral act to oneself was more significant than committing the immoral act itself. As Asperger explained, there is a freedom that is much less restricted than that of action, which is why we consider it an even greater duty. Freedom afterwards, when the act is done, to take a position on it. It is about a decision. If one accepts the moral principle, submits to it and takes responsibility, or if one rejects it from spite or deceiving oneself, which never works. Therein lies the ultimate vindication or condemnation, the last measure of one's value as a human being. This is about an internal decision. Externally, no one does, need, does not need to do anything. No action, no word, no gesture. So Asperger held that what ultimately mattered was not doing wrong, but knowing it was wrong. It was about an external state of mind with no need for external atonement. It's this that kind of leads me to believe that, you know, in his own mind at least, I think Asperger did feel culpable, did feel responsible mm. for the children he had allowed to be killed. I think inwardly, if, at least, he was kind of seeking for some kind of atonement. And I think he recognised that maybe some of what he had done, or, at least, or, or what he had done at least, was wrong. Yeah, you know, you know, but he, you know, but as it's later said, I mean, he was a kid. Yeah, I, I just want to come in. That, you know, in that system. Yeah, can I? Can, can you want to do that? I just want to come into that. There's two. Vol I've got a two-volume um, book called Mal Fantasy, um, and it was written by um, a German 
academic psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, psychologist in the late early 1970s, 80s and what it is is speaking about his father and he's trying to come to terms with what happened in Germany, Nazi Germany and it's about a particular group, the, um, the Free Corps, um, who all in the end supported Adolf Hitler, um, which puts this argument about socialism out the window. Um, but I, I'm fed up with arguing that with, with people. Um, but what was amazing about this book, it, it didn't go down too well in this country because, you know, we're sort of anti-intellectual, but it was one of the first books from a new generation in Germany who wanted to find out why. It was almost like, um, it, it's a massive study, but it is a confession. Why did this happen? Um, we won't do it next week because it, it, it doesn't matter, it, it, there's a lot of reading. But I, I think Germany went through the guilt, and it still goes through it. You know, Germany is still guilty about what he did. It, it can't atone for what he did, what Hitler did. But don't let us be complacent. Because we had a whole lot of anti-Semites in this country in very high positions of power. So don't, you know, think it can't, it can't happen here. At a flick of an eye, it could happen. Well, uh, you know, we are not safe from that type of ideology. But as Bertolt Brecht said, uh, it's back on heat. No, I mean... Right, oh, you know, you could do that one or, or this well, one? Well, I mean, I'd like to read a little bit from, uh, from, from this one. I mean, you know, kind of going back into to Hitler, we're going to, you know, all this system which Asperger was a part of, it was a, it was a very huge system, you know, and it was right from the, uh, the kind of the eugenics were introduced into the regime right from the start. Oh, is there? Mm. Yeah, and, okay, and uh, it just says here, okay, this is, uh, I'm reading from uh, How to Read Hitler by Neil Greger. Within six months of establishing itself in power, the, the Nazi regime, had introduced the law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring. Issued in 1933, this law formalized the right of the state to sterilize forcibly any individual whom its representatives regarded as suffering from a range of allegedly hereditary illnesses or from particular physical disabilities. It initiated a massive program of forced sterilization which led to approximately 350,000 German women and men being rendered infertile against their wishes by 1945. And this was just the beginning, as you're about to discuss mm. here, Alfie, yeah. with the final solution. Now, as I say, very sorry about this, folks. It's been very depressing. But this oh, is yeah. the final one. Uh, is it the final one? Yes, it is. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, it's a book it's called The Villa, The Lake, The Meeting. Vonsi and the Final Solution by Mark Rossman. Vonsi um, was a large palace on the outskirts of Berlin and um, it was a meeting that was called by Weinach Heydrich. Um, possibly, I, I don't believe in the definition of good and evil, but possibly the closest individual that you could get to evil was, uh, uh, was his character. Um, could you just read that? Alan's much better at reading than I am, as you probably gathered. Could you just read the back part of that and then I'll get straight into it? Okay. It's a fancy. Okay. By Mark Roseman, this yeah. book is, yeah. yeah. Mark Roseman, The Villa, The Lake, The Meeting, One Sea, and The Final Solution. On 20th of January 1942, the most murderous meeting in history took place. Chaired by Reinhard Heydrich, one of the most feared men in Germany, it summons top Nazi officials to a grand villa on the shore of Berlin's Lake Wannsee in order to clarify the final solution of the Jewish question. They ate good food, 
drank cognac and smoked cigars and in less than two hours had effectively sentenced six million people to death. Only one set of minutes from this secret meeting survived and argument has raged over its contents. Thank you, Alan. And again, please accept our apologies. Anyway, I've, I've, I've only spent a lot of time about this because the cover and the back cover explains what happened. Now, from that meeting, um, fortunately, what came out is a list of the murder, the extermination, or the extinction. I'm not calling it murder. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. This was the extinction of a race of people who were different to Nazis. But it wasn't only related to Germany. It was related to every country in the world with a Jewish population. And it's got the figures all carefully worked out. All these, all these countries, once Germany had conquered the world, or, or their idea of the world, they would turn their minds to everywhere, you know, Turkey, America, England, just read it, Portugal, Romania, Ukraine, USSR, well USSR suffered, um, in fact the USSR won the Second World War, and I mean it, there's a whole list, plus the amount of people, Jews, who were going to be eliminated, wiped out from the face of the earth. What this also points out, and what is obvious from what we've been talking about and exploring, this doctrine wouldn't have ended there anyway. The Vonsi doctrine opened the gate, the doors to hell of every group who were deemed non-German. So once all these people have been eliminated, wiped off the face of the earth, you know, we're talking hundreds of millions of people here, um, they would turn their attention to all the other people, homosexuals, Roma, lesbians, gays, lesbians, keep on going on. The list is endless. I mean, I we're talking about murdering the bloody world. So it's stuff like this that we need to keep at the back of our minds. Now, the thing about Heidelich, he was a very cultured man, loved classical music, could play the piano beautifully, um, loved everything German, every, you know, loved the nation, uh, part aristocrat, joined the party very early which again knocks this argument of socialism. Um, he was also a brilliant sword fencer, a wonderful companion over dinner. Yeah, he was a psychopath. He gathered psychopaths around him. And if you look at his photo, you see something staring at you that is almost inhuman. But he does look the perfect Nazi. His long coat, his medal, his sword, his walk, it's all there. The perfect Nazi is the perfect psychopath. Um, now, <laughs> shall we end it there? Or what? Ah, as I say, folks, look, sorry, we needed to get this done. Yeah. As, as uh, a, a, that is why. That old project is, I mean, it's is called always, Creativity and Madness. Yeah, I mean, it's ca always kind of lingering on the, kind of the shadows, kind of these extreme aspects of uh, human nature, these murderous aspects of human nature that seek to eliminate people who do not fit the norm mm. or, or, or uh, the, you know, other people's idea of what should be the norm, should be you know, the Volker, the, the Gemot, or 
or in this country you you might say what your people who are true British or truly normal and then you can you do see it in a sense you know taking place in this country with kind of like the welfare reforms you know uh, Grenfell Tower you know and aspects of Bre and aspects of Brexit mm. What's going on? The way that uh, and also ten years of austerity. That's true. Yeah, that's what I meant. You know, ten years of austerity, you know, of which the welfare reforms have kind of come mm. out of that. And, and as always, uh, the many are paying for the mistakes of the few. And that, mm. and, you know, that's you had that in, you know, in Nazi Germany. The many and I, the many were pay, paid for the mistakes of of, of the of the few, the intentions of the few. And it was it was it was horrible. It, it was it was disgusting. And yeah, the way that kind of difference. And you know, diversity and all its kind of vitality and its forms is just automatically crushed. This failure to distinguish and this unwillingness to distinguish what is different from what is dangerous and harmful. Mm. And you know, and this uh, you know, the conflation of difference with harm is uh, in, 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 some, in some societies, particularly in Nazi Germany, is what kind of creative that you know uh, people are always kind of thriving against and what and where kind of madness in a sense kind of comes from and languishes at the same time so now, you know, this is yeah we can end it there i think yeah just on one note as um after the war um Adorno, the great um cultural theorist said that after Auschwitz, poetry died Fortunately, poetry has, hasn't died. No, thank God for that. I, yeah. I can assure so, you it's not. Um, no. as I say, excuse this was such a, a heavy introduction. Um, we haven't quite worked out where we're going next week, but I don't think it's going to be this heavy. No. But it's, gonna it's still asking the question. Creativity and madness. Um, now, there is a Facebook wall that's been set up, which is creativity and madness um, and the title of the Facebook the Facebook wall is rising stars future dreams so it's a bit of positivity that we can start looking at um, I think on that note folks we are both emotionally shattered <laughs> Aye. and uh, until next week until next week uh, goodbye goodbye Whew. How many years was that one? <laughs>